Transcontinental travel in the United States of America has changed over time. Traversing the continent has evolved from early explorers setting out on foot, to wagon trains, to a blending of highway systems, and finally to a very simple, high-speed and efficient system. With innovations brought forth by the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956, the way people traveled in the United States for years to come will change immensely. A Wayward Journey Innovation in Transportation Leads to the U.S. Interstate Highway System by Henny Barnes North America was initially a land of water and coastal transportation as early settlers formed colonies. The United States was expanding in the 1800s as more people started moving west. The Donation Land Claim Act of 1850, followed by the Homestead Act signed into law by President Lincoln, promised land to settlers who migrated west. With news of better land to farm on, free land, gold, and new beginnings, wagon trains started. The journey to the west was long and hard. People traveled about 10 miles a day at 2 miles an hour. The Oregon Trail, the longest of the wagon trains, took five months to travel on, with rain increasing the trip by several weeks. As the west was being settled, many simple, cheap, one-lane dirt roads were built that were so uneven that people would always be getting stuck in ruts and would sometimes have to lean in their vehicle to avoid tipping over. Paving with bricks, asphalt, and oiled rocks were expensive and hard to come by too. Later in the early 1900s, though, the government planned to build a highway system that would go all the way across the U.S. The nation needed a improved type of highway. We already had a network of two-lane highways pretty much connecting the entire country. The Lincoln Highway was built in 1913. It ran from New York to San Francisco, running 3,150 miles. Traveling across country became over two times faster. Roads were poorly designed and problems existed throughout the network. In 1919, to highlight some of the problems, the Transcontinental Motor Combo was put together by the U.S. Army to determine the time it would take the Army to travel across country during an invasion, as well as to highlight many of the issues existing within the highway system. Issues such as auto accidents and accident-related fatalities were increasing along with the number of cars on the road. The Grapevine, one of the worst mountain roads in California, had to be closed because of dangerous zigzags and an unacceptable number of deaths. With no guardrails or shoulder and narrow, slippery roads, you were always in danger of going off a cliff. Not only were the roads dangerous, but they were confusing too. Many different names confused people, so a simple numbering and symbol system was introduced in 1924. When President Eisenhower took office in 1953, he saw the need for better highways and acted right away. His support for the new highways would be directly attributed to his experience in 1919, when he was part of the Army's first transcontinental motor convoy. He wrote a book called At Ease, Stories I Tell to Friends. A chapter about the trip contained the quote in it, The trip had been difficult, tiring, and fun. With his experience on the Lincoln Highway, plus his observations of the German Autobahn network during World War II, he was convinced to support construction of the interstate system. The old convoy had started me thinking about good, two-lane highways, but Germany had made me see the wisdom of broader ribbons across the land. His grand plan for highways, announced in 1954, led to the 1956 legislative breakthrough that created the Highway Trust Fund. Eisenhower argued for the highways as a purpose of national defense. In the event of invasion by foreign power, the military would need good roads to be able to quickly transport troops around the country. With the majority of Americans wanting better highways, Eisenhower pushed for them even more and finally succeeded. The National Interstate and Defense Highways Act, commonly known as the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956, was enacted in June of that year. It would be the largest public works project to that point in time in American history, with $26 billion spent on construction. Existing highways were improved and linked together, reducing travel time across country from two months to two weeks. The money was handled in a highway trust fund that paid for 90% of highway construction costs, with the states required to pay the remaining 10%. It was expected that the money would be generated through new taxes on fuel, automobiles, trucks, and tires. This construction would last for 20 years. Many trustworthy people were chosen to be in charge of the whole project, though, handling the money and construction. This was the largest public works expenditure in U.S. history. Enough pavement was put down to make a parking lot big enough to hold two-thirds of the cars in the USA. It was also big enough to build six sidewalks to the moon. 
Construction accelerated throughout the early 1960s. By the end of 1962, 14,300 miles of the interstate system had been opened. A year later, 16,600 miles were opened. After the Act of 1956 was passed, many problems arose. Funds were stolen from and money was running out. In February 1961, President Kennedy wrote to Congress, Our federal pay-as-you-go highway program is in peril. He explained that in 1959, President Eisenhower had signed legislation increasing the gas tax to four cents per gallon as a temporary measure that would expire July 1st, returning the tax to three cents. Five years after the 1956 law, President Kennedy approved the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1961. The new law made the four cent gas tax permanent and adjusted other excise taxes to support completion of the interstate system. At the same time, negative press coverage was coming out about the highways and the people who were in charge. The Great Highway Robbery, which criticized the government officials working on the highways, was published on February 4, 1962, in Parade Magazine. Representative John A. Blatnick, who was the head of the Special Subcommittee on the Federal Aid Highway Program, was quoted as saying, Corruption permeates the highway program and stigmatizes the whole road-building industry. The committee's counsel... Walter May suggested throwing a dart at the U.S. map. Wherever it sticks, we can find something wrong with the new highways. In October, Rex Whitten, the newly appointed head of the highway department, was interviewed on the David Brinkley Show and responded to the charges of corruption. In response, federal oversight on the spending and quality controls were strengthened. Our highways still continue to grow today. Interstate 73, a new East Coast Highway plan is currently in legislation. Traveling is much more efficient and easier than on the early roads of our country. Companies like UPS and FedEx can ship items across country in a matter of days. The original layout was perfect for what it was, and we've had the flexibility to provide additional routes over the years. Without the innovations of President Eisenhower, transportation would not be as efficient and easy. With the completion of the major interstate highway improvements in the Act of 1956, the nation had a system of highways connecting our country. U.S. productivity grew by 31% with the interstate highways providing a quick means of shipping food and commodities. Factories which traditionally had to be located near major cities now could be located anywhere in the country where they benefited most from tax breaks and proximity to materials. The new highway system facilitated the internal migration in our country as people followed their companies. The interstate highways gave us an opportunity to reorganize our economy with safer, faster, and cheaper roads. Industry and business expanded their market throughout the U.S. and into foreign markets. Traveling to places during times of emergency like hurricanes and other disasters became much easier because roads were wider and bigger, allowing more people to be on the roads at a time. The automobile companies dropped their prices so they could sell more cars and still make a profit. Some cars only cost a few hundred dollars right off the assembly line. On the downside, small town America located along the old highways lost business and suffered economically. Many of them depended on tourism and people just passing through, so when the big interstate highways bypassed them, they were forced to adapt and rely on other sources to keep going. We have uh, a system that provides so much access and mobility to so such a large portion of the country that uh, it, it, it was innovative at the time. It has a tremendous impact on how people travel and where they vacation and, and where they live and work. And uh, it's, it's changed our country's uh, perspective on mobility and the freedom to move around. So uh, I think it's actually made our country more free. Our country would not be where it is today without the National Interstate Highway System. It was a much needed improvement that had a huge impact and changed our country. Well, if you ever plan to go to West, Jack, take my way, it's the highway, that's the best. Get your kick. 